Well, the church is uh, suffering from some image problems. Uh, because of those image problems, uh, young people are leaving the church. David Kinneman, president of Barna Research, tells us, well, we already know that uh, people from the age group 18 to 29, we call them millennials, uh, are leaving the church at a rapid pace. And he identifies six reasons. This is just kind of for our information. The first one that they give is isolationism. isolationism excuse me, isolationism. One-fourth of those in that, that age group say that church demonizes everything outside the church, including music and movies and culture and technology that define their, their generation. The second one is shallowness. Uh, One-third just think the church is boring. Uh, about one-fourth say that faith is irrelevant, that the Bible teaching is unclear. Third reason is anti-science. Uh, the young people are saying, up to one-third of them are saying that the church is out of step with sci scientific development and uh, debate. Fourth topic that they raise, there's a reason why they're, they're falling away, is because of sex. The church is perceived as simplistic and judgmental, and, and some of them uh, just say the say no philosophy or statement that the church makes just doesn't work for them. And they note that young Christian singles are as sexually active as their non church friends, and so they feel judged. Uh, the fifth reason is exclusivity three and ten feel the church is just too exclusive in what has become a very pluralistic society. And the same number feel forced to choose between their faith and their friends. The church becomes a problem for them in their lives. And the last one is just because there's doubt. The church is not able, church is not uh, a safe place for them to bring up their questions, for them to express their doubts. They don't feel the church really can handle that. And so when they have questions, um, they, they leave the church. When, when asked if it was important, this is the, the statistic that got me the most. When asked if it was important to be a part of a church, only two in ten said that, yes, they thought it was important. So four out of five people who are 18 to 29 years old say that being a part of a church is not an important thing to them. And, you know, people are just kind of looking at the church and going, I expect more. I expect more out of Christians. Just this week, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who uh, is a realtor and who is a Christian, but he does not attend church. He hasn't for some time. And that very day, a man who was selling his home and is going to become on staff of one of the large, larger churches here in, in Lexington had beat my friend out of $10,000 in realtor fees. And because of that, my friend talking to me on the phone said, that's why I don't go to church, you see, because here's a leader of the church that just beat me out of $10,000 that he owed me. Very unethical. Has a good point. It does seem, at least from some angle, that uh, maybe Jesus would be better off without the church, you know, is what some people think. Because almost everyone loves or at least likes Jesus, and few say anything bad about him. It's the people that follow him that some people have some problems with. So, so what's your image of the church? I mean, obviously, it's not too awful bad because you're here at the gathering, even though the gathering is kind of an unchurched church, you know. It's, it's the gathering. Uh, but, but still, you, you must have a more positive image of the church because you're involved in one. You're, you're attending one. Hopefully, it's, it's better than that. That's what we want to talk about today. In the New Testament, uh, the word... Uh, that is translated as church as ecclesia. And it means assembly of believers or fellowship of believers, but 
to help us understand what the church is, is really like, Jesus and Paul use three primary metaphors to talk about the church. They say that the church is like a family. That's the primary metaphor. It's like a household. Um, in the Greek, it was oikos. It was a group of extended family people, nuclear and beyond, and that's the way the church functions. Then uh, the other, one of the second metaphor would be as, as a body, the body of Christ. And it says, you're each members, you're connected. Um, you know, every, every member is important in the body. You have a toothache, it's a little bitty tooth, but boy, it can really hurt a lot, right? And, uh, and that's a good metaphor that uses. The third metaphor that's used is that you are the temple. The church is the temple of God, meaning this is the place where God meets the world is in you, the community of believers. And that's the three primary metaphors that are used in Scripture. The church, the assembly of believers, the family of God, the body of Christ is like a temple. This is where God lives. Now, for almost 400 years, you know, the church was the magnet that attracted people. It, it, we, we miss this today. The early church was so much of a community, so much a family, so much a body, so much a temple, that those who knew nothing of Jesus Christ, and sometimes were coming from very pagan lifestyles, came to him not just because they heard that he was such a great savior, but they were attracted by the community attracted by the church. And it's exactly the opposite of what a lot are experiencing. I mean, today we, we say to somebody, why don't you come to church with me? They're not too bad, right? It's, they're, they're not as stuffy as some other people are. You know, they're, they're, they're not as rigid as some other people are maybe. And, you know, you, you'll, you're going to be surprised. It's not as bad as what you think it might be. I mean, that's that's the normal invitation that we'd give to somebody today to come to church, you know. I mean, let's be real. That's what's said. They aren't that bad. But for the first 400 years, the church was this magnet that because of who they were and the way they treated each other, the way that they lived, it attracted a lot of people. So we say, well, 400 years, well, what happened? You know, well, what happened is that Christianity became the religion of the land. Constantine, Roman emperor, was converted. And he declared that now everybody that was in the Roman Empire was Christian. You know, the Edict of Milan. That's what he said. Uh, he thought everybody else should be Christian too. So, you know, if you were a Roman, you were just considered to be Christian now. It was... Entire cities went and got baptized. They just march everybody down to the river and march them in the river and out. And now you're a Christian. Everybody, you know, that's the way it went for a while. Society began to elevate the clergy. They now became, instead of being kind of outcasts of the Roman Empire, now they were seen as the leaders of the culture. And the church began to lose what it was to be you know, the family of God, the, the body of Christ, the, the temple. And, you know, by that time, about half of the Roman Empire had become Christians, had been converted to Christianity from Judaism and pagan religions, and the magnet for them was the community, the church, because they loved one another. They, they loved each other the way that Jesus loved them, and their lives were so attractive that others said, I, I don't know what it is that you've got, but I want to be a part of you. And who it was that was doing the work in it was Jesus. See, now Jesus and Paul gave some some very specific instructions to followers of Christ as to how they were to treat each other, and these instructions are included in the phrase "one another." And today we have the first of five weeks of the one another's. I'm just going through five of them. This is kind of the primary one: love one another. And it's very important because I think once again we're at that place in a culture where who the church is will determine the spiritual lives of other people who are looking. They're looking at us and they're saying, do I want to be like you? Do I want to be in the church? We, we have that, that opportunity before us. The first one another is without doubt the most important and the greatest for he says love one another. Now, 
before we read this scripture, I want to just kind of set the context. I did just a little bit at communion, but that's what that's, that's where this takes place. It takes place in that upper room. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the communion service. John does not record the communion service. What John records is the foot washing. So they're up there in that upper, upper room together, and Jesus had just washed their feet, and he said, serve each other the way that I serve you. And then he gives them this instruction, John 13, 34 to 35. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Then later that evening, uh, just a little bit later, he, he, he gives it again in John 15, 12. He repeats himself. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then John 15, 17, same thing. These things I command you so that you will love one another. He says it three times. Three times in this context, he tells them to love one another. It's last evening with them. Here he has, he's poured his life into these 12 guys. All of his, you know, for three years, he's poured his life into them. And he's trusting them with the responsibility of taking this kingdom to the world and literally the hope of the world is resting on these guys and at that time he gives them this new commandment and he says love one another now when, when we say you know love one another we might very well mean that we have strong emotions for someone or uh, that we like them right we need them maybe to say you know, to love someone, say, I, I, I don't think I could live without this person. That's very important. But of course, when Jesus said love one another, he was using love as an action verb. And he was not saying you need to like each other. Uh, what he was saying was that he says, I want you to love each other like I have loved you. And, and they understood what he meant. They meant that, that he was, you know, he had given his life to these 12 guys for three years. And they knew what that meant. And they were going to put each other first the way that he had put them first. And they would sacrifice for one another. And they would, they would give each other the benefit of the doubt. And they would not talk one, about one another or scheme behind each other's backs or manipulate one another. They would look out. Look, they would look back on that night and they remember that night how he had washed their feet. And then he said, I want you to treat other people just like I've treated you. And he gave this commandment. To his close followers this commandment does not go to the world this commandment goes to his followers goes to the church he, he gave this to the family of god he gave this to the body of christ to the temple of god now it really made an impression on john because john the apostle because he he put it in his gospel and then he also put it in his letter in first john he writes about it much more and i'm just going to read one passage but first john 4 19 to 21 he says, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Love's not an option, you see. It's a commandment. It's, it's not love if you feel like it commandment like don't steal don't lie don't murder it's up there with those love one another now why well he tells us why this is so important is jesus said we are to love the world we are to love each other and the world will know that we are his followers and i mean the, the world's not going to say oh you you must be a follower of jesus christ because you know um you're so popular or you're not the follower of Jesus Christ because you act so holy. Um, you're not the follower of Jesus Christ because you know some big words and you got things underlined in your Bible. You're a follower of Jesus Christ because I see how you guys love each other. Jesus must be real. And God, the, the world's going to say, God must be doing something. God must be alive because you people love each other in the way that nobody else loves each other. Yeah, sure, he... Unique mission, unique mission to reach the world. Now, he also said, love your neighbor 
Remember, love your neighbors, you love yourself. He also said, love your enemies. But there's a progression here. First, we love each other. How can we expect it to love our neighbor if we don't love each other? And how can we expect it to love our enemies if we don't love our neighbors? You see, there's a progression here. This is a, everything hangs on this. This is so important. Everything hangs on this new commandment. The neglect of loving one another may be why many people look at Christians and say, well, I, I like their Savior, I love their Savior, but I don't want to live like them. But in the same way, when Christians do love one another, it's so powerful that few people can continue to deny the, the reality of Jesus Christ and his community when following this new commandment would be so evident, so, so different from the world that people would know that it has to be from Jesus. Now, today, a lot of people think that they can be Christians and followers of Jesus Christ and not be part of a church, not be part of a family, not, not be part of the body. And they say, you know, I can do this all by myself. I am very devout, and I, I read my Bible, and I pray, and, you know, I can do this because I love Jesus. It's just me and Jesus. It sounds right. I mean, who's going to argue with that? right? It sounds so right, but it's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is because how can the world know that we are his disciples by the way we love each other if we don't have anybody else to love? And if you're just by yourself, if you're a lone ranger Christian, you've got no one else to love. You see, there's a problem there. Love means that we put the other person first, but we can't keep the commandment if there's no other person that we're in community with to put first. Now, people usually get irritated with me when I bring this up because we all have somebody that we know that's a very good person, maybe a better person than we are, and they, they love God, and yet they're not a part of a church. And so we, we think on them. We think, well, Don's kind of judging them. He's kind of being hard on them. You know, oftentimes those people have been the victim of the church. Something bad has happened. Maybe, maybe somebody's lied to them or a pastor cheated them or, you know, like my friend that just lost $10,000 to the pastor. Something bad has happened to them. And so now they stay home and they, they pray and they really follow and, and they're, they're great people, but they can't love one another because there's no another to love. You know, Jesus really gave just two reasons on why the world would believe, and they're both right here in John. And the first one is this one, that the world would see the love that Christians have for each other in the community, and the community would be so strong that they would be attracted to the community. And then later on in chapter 17, he has this high priestly prayer, we call it, and he prays that the Christians will be united. He says, I pray that in the same way that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me, I pray that you will be one so the world would believe. So we have two reasons as to how the world is to be reached through the Christian community. And the first one is the way we love one another, and the second one is the unity that we have, that we have unity in him. You can't love someone. You can't love without someone to love, and you can't be alone and have unity. So following Christ is a community effort, and it can't be done alone. You know, for, for years, scientists were baffled by something, um, and that was by the way that fire ants float together. Okay, we're going off on a different page here, as you obviously saw that kind of weak transition. But fire ants, when they would drop them in the water, would not be able to float, and they would struggle around and just drown, okay? Except if there were a bunch of them, they would form a raft, and there was an article in the Los Angeles Times last year that summarized the news research, the kind of things that we study. But this one's kind of neat, okay? And it's unlocked the secret of this mystery. After collecting a bunch of ants, scientists drop them into containers of water, and the ants quickly spread out, and they form themselves into rafts. And each individual ant used its claw and the adhesive pads on their legs. I didn't even know they had adhesive pads on their legs, but I guess they do. And to grip onto each other. And one researcher said, at first it just looks like a, a tangle of bodies and limbs everywhere, but the longer you look at the picture, the more you're able to distinguish between different body parts and see the connection. And then the insects use their air pockets that form around their bodies to keep themselves afloat. 
So they concluded, the research sheds light on how deeply social insects act together, almost as if they're part of a, and I love this phrase, super, or, super, super, orgat, super <laughs> organisms. Man, I'm struggling today. Super organism. As one scientist said, the individuals acting together create this awareness of the environment that no individual ant has. A super organism. Form together where the individuals, um, you know, attach to one another in such a way. Great description of the church. Individuals acting together and creating an awareness of the environment that no individual has. So how do we do that? How do we float together when we would sink by ourselves? How do we float by following this commandment to love one another? Peter was there in the upper room that night when Jesus gave that new commandment. And later in his life, he said this, 1 Peter 4, 8. He said, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. He says, this is more important. Above all, he says, here it is, listen to me. He says, keep loving one another. Why? He says, because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, I've heard this interpreted a couple of ways. The first way says that Peter is saying that, that God's love uh, covers our multitude of sins. And I think that's true, that God's love does cover our sins. But there's also another way. He's telling us to keep on loving because when we love, we cover the multiple sins of other people. When we, we, we love, we cover their sins. We love each other not because we have no weaknesses or they have no weaknesses, but we cover sins and weaknesses of other people. Everybody needs grace, right? Everybody needs some grace. We need grace directly from God. We need grace from God directed through others, especially those in the family of God, in the body of Christ, in the temple. Had an old book that I saw the other day. It was a Christian book for man. It's called Man in the Mirror. It came out about 20 years ago, and in it, it had a story that I think fits here. Uh, Patrick Morley tells a true story about the fishing trip of some men, and they went up to a remote bay in Alaska, and with a pontoon um, aircraft, a water uh, plane, and landed there and had a wonderful day catching salmon for a while, but. When they returned to their seaplane, the, the tides had messed with it and the, it had taken it up on some rocks on a bank. And so they couldn't get it off the rocks, so they waited till the next morning for the tides to come in. But when they took it off, they uh, started taxiing down the lake, or excuse me, down the, the bay, and they could only just get a couple feet off the ground because one of the pontoons was filled with water. And so they came crashing back down the sea and the plane started to sink, tipped to one side, filled up with water. And so uh, the passengers, three men and a 12-year-old boy, son of one of the men, prayed and then they, they jumped into the very rigid waters of uh, the Alaskan waters and uh, the riptide was strong. And Two of the men reached the shore just completely exhausted and they looked back and they saw uh, the father with his arms around his son as they were being swept out to sea. And the boy had not been strong enough to, to make it and the father was a very strong swimmer, but he had chosen to, to die with his son rather than to live without him. And we hear those stories and we say, man, that's love. That's, that's, you know, Jesus says to us, he says, here's a new commandment. Love one another, cover each other's sins. Where someone else is weak, you be the strong one. Swim with them, you know. Where one person is weak, give them some of my strength. I've been thinking about this and uh, about the present state of the church in America. I worry about these things. I know you guys don't, but I do. I, I worry about when you see 
people leaving, young people leaving the church and the church apparently in decline. And uh, so I began to kind of dream and vision, you know, uh, what is God doing right now? What's, what's going on? And I've kind of got the gift of seeing things that are wrong, you know. It's not a, really a gift, it's really a curse, you know. But I, I, I can look at things and say, oh, I'm I identify what's wrong with that so quickly, uh, much quicker sometimes than what I can to see what's right about something. I, I just get so agitated sometimes with things that are wrong, you know, that it really stirs me up. So I started thinking about this. What if, you know, what if, what if my greatest contribution, or maybe yours too, is, is not uncovering what's wrong, but your greatest contribution is in covering the wrongs of others. What if, what if I got really gifted at covering over the wrong of another person, of using my strength for another person's weakness? What, what if we became strong uh, in dying to ourselves, kind of like the father with the son being swept out to sea? And dying to my own self so that I might help the weakness of another person. What if, what if the church really grew into a, a kind of community that was magnetic where other people said, I, I want to be a part of them. I, I, I don't know this Jesus, but I want to be a part of this community because they're representing him. And there's something the way that they love each other that's different. Isn't that a neat vision? That's the original vision that Jesus had for the church. That we would love each other with such intensity and such completeness the way that he loved us that others would be attracted to that. Let's sit in prayer for a minute. As deep cries out 